Okay, so so if you guys got questions as we go along or, or want to know something more about a particular point, this is going to be a, a pretty broad overview of silvo pastures. Um, just ask your question, type it in the chat, Jimmy. If you see it in the chat, just just stop me and we'll we'll talk about it. And I've got Kelly on here too. Kelly Mercer is my graduate student and uh, close to finishing. I'm, I have to read her last chapter for dissertation today. And um, and she she has done extensive work in silvo pastures and, and did a um, shade study with different forage species while we were in uh, Virginia together and she came to Kentucky with me. So, so we're very happy to have her on the call too and she can help answer questions. So I'm gonna share my screen now. And, um, and start my presentation. And, and this is a presentation that, that, um, that my colleague and I made when I was in Virginia. And uh, my colleague is Dr. John Fike. And John was kind of the leader of our silvopasture group in, in Virginia. And he's a, a professor at Virginia Tech University on the main campus in Blacksburg in, in forages and, and the forage extension specialist in, um, in Virginia now. And uh, so I'd like to draw attention to him and give him credit for, for some of the slides in this presentation. And the title of the presentation is Made in the Shade, Civil Pastures in the Mid-Atlantic Region. Um, one, one difference that you'll notice today is that a lot of the silvo pasture work that's been done as we get further south has been done with um, pine plantations. And, and they really make ideal silvo pastures. Now we can do silvo pastures with hardwoods also, um, but, but they're a little bit slower to establish. Um, so so I, I want to go over what a silvo pasture is and what it is in, in the next few slides. And this was a definition that Ke Kelly kind of put together. This is, um, the silvo is derived from a Latin word for forest, so it's, it simply means a forested pasture, you know, a laid area where animals would, would graze or we would harvest forage on. And, and that's the tech, technical definition of a pasture. And you'll see in this picture, we've, we've got some cattle between rows of trees and those trees are, are I can't identify them from here, but probably a loblolly uh, pine plantation somewhere uh, south of uh, Southern Virginia. What silvo pasture isn't is new. Silvo pasture has been around as long as this country has been here um, in, in various forms. One of the things that, that differentiates silvo pasture in, in other forms of woodlot grazing is management. So what, what silvo pasture really is, is grazed, is, is managed grazing underneath a tree canopy. What it isn't is turning cows into to a forested area. We can actually do a significant amount of damage to trees if we allow cows free access to woodlots. And, and this really gives this whole notion of silvo pasture a, a bad name. And um, we see that through the NRCS. The NRCS is about managed grazing and, and they kind of, um, they, they kind of re, re, uh, are not on board with the silvo pasture in some cases because they have a bad experience with woodlot grazing in the past. So another thing silvo pasture isn't is a single pasture in a tree, a single tree in a pasture. We often see this as we're driving down the road and, and livestock impact underneath single trees and pastures will eventually kill that tree. So not, not in a year or two, but, but maybe in five years or a decade of, of continuous soil disturbance and root damage underneath that tree, that tree will die. And we see that here at the research station. We've got several trees and pastures and, and, um, and the animals tend to congregate in those areas in the summertime to try to get a little bit of shade and, and that will eventually kill those single trees. So that's not silvo pasture either. What silvo pasture is, is, is a sustainable practice and it's an intentional, intensive integrated management of trees, forages, and livestock all together in a system. 
And one of the neat things about Silva Pasture is that it has two economic time frames on it. And this is sometimes hard to get your mind around, but, but we have the immediate time frame, which we're kind of used to, which would be the livestock component. So we'll have a revenue source coming in from the livestock forage component. And then we have the long-term time frame, which would be the revenue stream from the forest production or from the tree production within that system. And that could be anywhere from, from 20 years to, to 30 years in, in a pine plantation or even longer in a hardwood plantation. In, in since I'm not a forestry guy, it's hard to wrap my mind around that long of a, re, a, um, a revenue stream. But the neat thing about the silvo pastures incorporates both the short and the long-term revenue streams. So these are some benefits uh, as defined by Hamilton of silvo pastures. And one would be increased cool season forage growth in a silvo pasture. And when you think about why that happens, if you think about cool season grasses, they're gonna be most productive in, in the spring and the fall. They have what we call a bimodal forage distribution. So we get um, the most growth in the spring and then we get a step, second hump of growth in the fall. And then growth during the summer months is often temperature limited. In a silvopasture situation, we're actually modifying the microclimate or that, that climate underneath that canopy, and that can enhance cool season growth, especially during the summer months. Not only enhance forage growth of cool season grasses, but it can also modify that microclimate to make some species that may be marginally adapted to that area of the country um, better adapted uh, because it moderates the temperature during the summer months. We can have improved or sustained tree production. And uh, what we're doing is we're getting in there and we're actively managing those trees in that, in that silvopasture situation. So we can actually improve the quality of that tree crop coming out of that particular um, silvopasture situation. Provide shade for livestock. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute, but that's a pretty important uh, benefit of silvopastures for livestock producers. We can improve wildlife habitat. And we don't talk enough about wildlife as part of a whole systems approach to, to farms, but um, wildlife can be an important revenue source on some farms, um, hunting rights or day hunts and, and so forth. Um, and that can be enhanced with silvopasture production by creating more habitat for wild, different types of wildlife. We can reduce erosion and improve water quality with good silvopasture management. And then the aesthetic value, there's a lot of aesthetic value in silvopastures. There's probably not any type of, of pasture or, or forage production that's more beautiful than a well-managed silvopasture. We have the, the trees and the forage underneath it and grazing animals, it's, it has great aesthetic value. And then the last one is improved economic performance. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how that works in silver pastures in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about livestock production. And this, this photograph is um, from a long-term silver pasture study that's run by Dr. Fike at uh, Virginia Tech, one of the research farms near campus. And um, these are actually some different tree species that they were evaluating in tree spacing, row spacing for um, silvo pastures. This is an older study, but it's kind of a neat study. It was done in the 1950s. And, and just because it's old doesn't mean it's not good anymore. And this is an, an average of four years of data on average daily gain of cows and calves with natural shade, artificial shade, and no shade. It, and I wanna make the distinction between natural shade and artificial shade. It, it, in my mind, natural shade is probably almost always better and that would be a tree canopy. And, and the reason it's better is it's not only intercepting the solar irradiation or the sunlight to help cool the animals, but it's also actively transpiring. So, so it's letting water out. It's like kind of like a big radiator is transpiring water out of that tree canopy and that's gonna make it cooler underneath that tree canopy. Uh, in my mind, the, the ideal shade source is the tree for livestock. Um, artificial shade is, is okay too, uh, better than no shade for sure. And if we look at, at cow gains, we see that we had 1.3 pounds per day and zero pounds 
for no shade. And if we look at no shade and artificial shade, we still had a significant improvement with artificial shade in terms of, of cow gains. Calf gains were, were similar. We had significant differences between natural shade and no shade and also artificial shade and no shade. What, what's this table telling us? This table is telling us that, that shade is an important part of, of animal production systems. Now, we don't always see big responses to shade, and, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is as we, as we move forward. This is another shade study, and this was with artificial shade in the feedlot production system. And what they found is when they supplied shade to those cattle, that they had um, improved animal gains. If you look at the final weight, they had improved um, average daily gains. They had improved dry matter intake. So that means those animals were eating more because they were more comfortable. Improved feed efficiency. So that's the amount of feed it takes to produce a pound of beef. So 5.9 versus 6.3. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but, but if you're finishing thousands of animals, that could be a, a very big deal in terms of feed efficiency. And then improved animal comfort is measured by respiration. So, so when, when an animal is, is heat stress in the summertime, it's going to be respiring faster. And, and that's exactly what this data shows with no shade. We've got um, 98 breaths per minute versus 80 breaths per minute with, with shade. So the thing to remember about about heat stress in animals is it's, it's just not temperature, but it's also humidity. It's that heat index, that combination of temperature and humidity. And it's not just solar irradiation or sunlight that's causing the heat stress, but it, it's also metabolic heat that's being produced inside the animal. If you think about a, a ruminant animal, essentially what it is is a large fermentation bat that on four legs, right? So all that fermentation in that conversion of cellulose and hemicellulose um, into volatile fatty acids is, is causing the generation of heat. And that's also a significant stress in terms of heat stress on the animal during the summer months. Tall fescue toxicosis, I'm sure you all have talked about that um, a, a lot in this class, but it increases the body temperature of the animal. It, it causes vasoconstriction in that causes the animal to have a, a um, low-grade fever, essentially. Shade is going to be most likely to impact the animal performance under extreme heat stress. So, so we can have shade in April and May of the year when, when temperatures are fairly moderated, and we're not going to see much of an impact. The impact is going to be during July and August when it's really hot. And those animals are under um, sustained heat stress from multiple sources, from, from the, the air temperature, from increased amounts of humidity, from, from the metabolic heat, from tall fescue toxicosis. All those things add up and cause an extreme amount of heat stress, especially during the summer months. That's when we're going to see the biggest impact of shade in, in grazing systems. The last thing I want to mention is shade in terms of an animal welfare issue. Um, we... We talk about shade from a production standpoint, but, but it's becoming more and more of an animal welfare issue. If someone drives by a pasture and there's a bunch of cows standing around in, in the hot sun with a black coat on in, in no shade, that quickly becomes an animal welfare issue. So that's something we've got to be very cognizant of as we move forward. John Fike put this slide together, and it, it, it kind of gets at this idea of the economic efficiency of silvopasture systems using something called the land equivalency ratio. And if, if we make it as a percent, if we have these things grown in a monoculture, so this is a forage, cattle, trees, um, grown in a monoculture, any one of those alone would be 100%. So when we mix these up into a silvopasture system and we've got trees and animals growing together um, in forages, it reduces the, the uh, production of any one of those things grown in that system. So for example, um, we may have 80% of the forage potential in that system. Cattle may perform a little bit lower in that, that system. 
that silvo pasture system. And definitely trees are going to be thinned out so that light can get down to the forage canopy in that system. So we're going to have a lot lower tree production in that system, right? But when you add those three things up in the system, it it makes greater than 100%. And, and that's one of the benefits of silvopasture. So we're not optimizing individual component production within a silvopasture, but we're optimizing system, whole system production. So it's a little bit of a different way to think about silvopasture um, production in terms of the land equivalency ratio. So, we commonly see this when we drive around the state, and that's cattle standing around in ponds. And, and that happens during the summer months, but it also happens in the spring when air temperatures are relatively cool. And one of the problems um, with our forage systems in Kentucky is that we have a lot of uh, toxic tall fescue in the system, and that causes these animals to undergo heat stress um, by vasoconstriction, even when air temperatures are relatively cool. And so one of the approaches to this riparian area problem has been fencing these areas out and providing water um, to the animals out in the pasture field. That improves our ability to manage grazing, which is a really good thing. But the negative aspect of this is that a lot of our shade in these pastures are located around riparian areas. So we're not only fencing the water out, we're fencing shade out in many cases. And um, so this can cause a problem in terms of, of livestock production. So, so fences don't really solve the problem of tall fescue toxicosis, right? So when we fence out um, riparian areas, animals are still undergoing heat stress caused by tall fescue toxicosis. Plus we fence out that that uh, shade source also. In this photograph, we've got a fence here uh, by the indicated by the red line, and we've got non-toxic fescue out here and toxic fescue here. And animals that are grazing toxic fescue are hanging out by their waters. They're making a mess, a mud hole, trying to get cooled off during the summer months while animals on non-toxic tall fescue are out grazing. The, the point that I wanna make with this slide is that that tall fescue, even if we mitigate tall fescue toxicosis with shade from silvo pastures, we're not getting rid of that problem. The toxins in tall fescue are so toxic, they're toxic at parts per billion level, and um, not parts per million, but parts per billion level. And so the only way to really get rid of, of uh, the tall fescue toxicosis is to remove toxic tall fescue from the grazing system. And silvo pastures may give us an opportunity to do that because they're modifying that microclimate and, and they're allowing us to establish new forage underneath that tree canopy. And, and a good choice may be a non-toxic tall fescue like a uh, novel endophyte tall fescue or a mixture of novel endophyte tall fescue and maybe orchard grass within that system. I, I think it's important to realize that that we do have a lot of toxic tall fescue in Kentucky and, and it's serving an important role. And, and that role is keeping the, the hillsides in Kentucky from, from washing away. As much as we moan and complain about tall fescue and grazing systems, it's done us a tremendous service in, in terms of soil stabilization. And before tall fescue, and there was a time before tall fescue, none, none of us remember it, but in the 19, 40s and 50s, before we had a lot of tall fescue, we had a lot of erosion in, in pasture systems. And the tall fescue has really mitigated the amount of erosion, so it served an important purpose. A pasture like this, we should not try to kill this tall fescue and replace it. It's just not simply not an option from an erosion standpoint. So, so we've got to mitigate the impact of that tall fescue on livestock. And one potential mitigation strategy would be providing shade for those livestock during the heat of the day. So providing shade may, may help to alleviate tall fescue toxicosis, but it's, it, it's not the cure all answer, right? So in, in I 
stress in this state meant help. It's, it's going to help to alleviate it. But because that toxin is so toxic in tall fescue, the only real way to alleviate it completely would be to replace that stand of tall fescue. Um, now, one of the benefits of silvopasture is that it modifies that microclimate underneath that tree canopy. And this happens to be a double row arrangement in, in a log lowly pine plantation. And you'll see um, the, the grass growing underneath here. By modifying this microclimate, we make other forage species, in, including orchard grass and, and probably red clover and uh, novel endophyte tall fescues, more competitive in this particular situa situation. So I want to talk a little bit about some strategies now for uh, introducing um, silvopastures into grazing systems. And, and there's several strategies to think about. And um, the first one is going from a mature timber stand to, to a silvopasture. So what we would do is we would thin the existing timber stand. So we would go in and uh, probably with a commercial thinning, not more, and we don't want to remove more than 50% of the basal area. And what the basal area is, is if we cut a tree off that stump area that's left, that would be what we would consider the basal area. And we add all that stump area up per acre and we come up with the basal area. And we don't want to remove more than 50% of that basal area. It, and that's very important. A hard commercial thinning will be about 40% of the basal area in that, in that timber stand. So we'll remove just slightly more. Um, and by removing 50% or less of that basal area, we're going to minimize, um, and we want to minimize harvesting damage. But by removing less than 50% of the basal area, we um, minimize wind damage and ice damage in, in timber stands. So when we think about a, a timber stand, all the trees are kind of working in, in conjunction to protect each other in that stand from wind and, and ice damage um, and kind of hold each other up. When we remove some of those trees, uh, we make that stand much more susceptible to wind and, and ice damage. So we don't want to remove too many. The other thing that can happen if we remove more than 50% of the basal area is that we'll get a very fast growth of the crown of that tree or the top part of that tree. And, and what can actually happen, especially in pine stands, is that that top of that tree grows so fast that the, the stem or the trunk of the tree can't support it, and it actually will bend over. And as that tree bends over, that breaks the water column in that, in that tree, and it actually dies. So the other challenge with um, going from mature stand to a silva pasture, so we thin it, is, is trying to figure out what to do with the stumps that are left. And, and if we're going to remove those stumps, we've got to be careful we don't damage the roots of the remaining trees. And, and there's a couple different approaches to this. I mean, we can grub the stumps out, but that's pretty intensive and, and causes damage to surrounding trees. We could potentially mulch to the soil surface. And, and the other option is we, we don't do anything. We just kind of work around those stumps. And, and that's not, not the ideal situation, but it's possible to do that in probably the lowest input and the lowest impact situation. One of the problems with having stumps remain in a silvo pasture is it makes it more difficult to do other operations like planting and fertilizing and liming. And as you'll see in a minute, we're definitely gonna need some fertility on, on most forested areas. And then uh, uh, we need lime, phosphorus, and potassium in most cases, and then some, some type of, of seabed preparation and seeding to convert that sand into a silvo pasture. Oh, I went to the end here. Hold on a second. I'm going to have to go back. Okay, hit the wrong button. Okay, so in, in a demonstration we did at the Southern Piedmont Center in um, Blackstone, Virginia, when I was a, a faculty member there at Virginia Tech, we used something called a, a mulcher, a landscape mulcher. 
and actually the the way this works is that it's got like a drum underneath this hood on here and that drum has teeth on it and essentially they just lower it and it mulches everything that's that's left pieces of wood stumps we can mulch to to the soil surface or a little bit below um, and kind of prepares a little seed bed that we can use to um, to plant into this is a mulcher working uh, mulching up residue and any any kind of regrowth that's left in this pasture situation I mean silvo pasture situation we probably mulched at the Southern Piedmont Center maybe three, I was trying to figure it out last night maybe 300 acres with this fairly costly to mulch about a thousand dollars an acre to mulch It does leave an area, it's not completely smooth, but an area that you can get over with lime and fertilizer trucks to uh, get fertility to this um, area that we're going to try to establish to pasture, which is absolutely critical in terms of establishing a productive forage stand. If we look at the nutrient needs, and this was for um, forested area in the south side of Virginia, and, and it'll be similar here, not, not exactly the same, but, but we'll still have a pretty high nutrient need here in most areas for forested land um, going into silvopasture. We had a four ton lime requirement. So four tons of lime, we had 250 pound requirement of phosphorus, uh, 150 pounds of K2O, and then some nitrogen on there to get the stand going. An interesting side note on the nitrogen application is that in, in this areas where we mulched, there's a fairly heavy residue. We measured up to around um, when the tops of the trees were not removed um, and chipped. We had about 55,000 pounds of residue per acre. So a pretty significant amount of residue in some cases. In some of the silvo pastures, if, if the price is right, they'll actually chip up everything that's left and remove it. And that leaves um, a significantly less mulch. Uh, in the area that's going to be converted into a silver pasture. So when, when we do the math on this, it comes up to about $450 per acre. And this is before the, the phosphorus price almost doubled last year. So, so it's going to be even more now. One alternative that we looked at for bringing up fertility in these areas, which was very economical, was the use of lime stabilized biosolid coming out of Washington, D.C. If you're not familiar with biosolids, biosolids are um, human waste that, that's been put, put through a treatment process, and lime stabilize indicates that, that one way that they're trying to, to kill the pathogens and is increasing the pH of it, so they add lime to that biosolid. So we worked with Recyc Systems, and um, we put out some different rates of, of uh, biosolids on some work that we did um, before Kelly came to the research station. And this was the nutrients in a dry ton of biosols. Now, biosols are not dry when they come. They're only a, about 30% dry matter. They're about 70%, 70 to 80% water when they come. And they're spread with a big uh, manure type spreader. This was the nutrients in a dry ton. If you apply two dry tons per acre, um, you'll get 100 pounds of plant available nitrogen, 140 pounds of P205, and 20 pounds of, of potassium. Now, the one thing the biosols lack is potassium because during the process, most of the potassium washes out of the biosol and ex exits the plant in, in the water that's uh, discharged, the treated water that's discharged from the uh, treatment plant. They also had about 0.8 tons, so... so uh, about three quarters of a ton of lime per acre at the two ton rate. So we're getting the value of these nutrients plus some lime value out of lime stabilized biosolids. We incorporated by disking and, um, and that's about $150 of nutrients per acre. Now the cost of biosolids is, is zero to the producer um, because these companies are looking for a place to discharge those biosolids onto. So the two options for biosolids is you either stick them in the landfill somewhere or, or you land apply them for agricultural use. And, and um, as long as the cost of land applying is lower than the cost of landfilling, 
um, they will provide biosolids to producers at no cost. So if um, we still need fertilizer, even when we apply uh, two dry tons of biosolids per acre. So if we add that up, that's um, a total fertility of cost when we're using biosolids at two tons, dry tons per acre, around $300. Now we'll go through the same scenario again, except we're gonna put on four dry tons this time. And when we do that, what we, we find is that we need less additional fertilizer and less, less lime, of course. And that brings our fertility cost down to around $160 per acre, which is, is becoming very reasonable for bringing forest land in, into production. Another alternative nutrient source is burrow litter. Now we would have greater access to burrow litter here in Kentucky than biosolids in most cases. And um, burrow litter can be a pretty good buy if you need to phosphorus in the litter. So this is the nutrient profile of, of burrow litter. It's about 40 to 50 pounds of um, plant available nitrogen, about 50 pounds of P2O5 and about 55 pounds of K2O. And if we apply four tons per acre, these are the amount of nutrients that we get. And then incorporated by disking it, that's about $300 worth of nutrients. Now, the cost of bird litter applied is going to be somewhere between $35 and $40 a ton. So we're getting $300 worth of nutrients for about $150. So it can be a, a pretty good buy. Still need some, some additional phosphorus in this particular situation and some additional lime because burr litter don't, do not have any lime value. And if we add up that additional things, we're going to be at about $388 per acre. The last option I want to talk about is, is pelleted biosolids. And um, that's when they take that biosolids that were produced at the waste treatment plant and actually pelletize them kind of into a, a granular form and then they can be applied with a, a regular fertilizer truck. Um, and if you apply those at two tons per acre, this is the amount of nutrients that you get. And, and you should have a copy of these slides. So I'm going pretty fast through these, but these are about the pounds of nutrients that we get. And then we incorporate by disking, you get about 184 pounds of nutrients per acre, $184 worth of nutrients per acre. Still need some additional um, potash and um, lime. And the total cost will be about $362 per acre. So a little bit less than, than burr litter. By far the best deal would, would be the um, land applied biosolids uh, straight out of the plant. And this, I'm not gonna go through all this. This is just a, a pros and cons of the different fertilizer sources. But the, the point that I wanna make with this is that there, there's no free lunch. I mean, if you're gonna bring forested land into production and silvo pasture, you have got to make that investment in soil fertility or else the pastures are just not gonna be productive. So the second scenario that I just wanted to touch on was converting an existing pasture. So you've already got an existing pasture established to a silvo pasture. And we're gonna assume that you're doing a good job with your pasture management and you have adequate soil fertility. So there'll be no, no additional costs there. We're going to assume that uh, we need to decide on a row spacing and orientation. So, so how do you want those rows to face the sun? North, south, east, west, and so forth. Um, you need to control grass strips and tree planting. They actually make machines called scalpers that will scalp a, a piece of sod back where you can plant a tree. The idea of doing this is that you're reducing the, um, the competition for that tree, that initial competition for that seedling that you're planting into that pasture. I'm not a big fan of, of scalping or pulling that sod back. I'd rather chemically control it with something like Roundup, maybe spray a strip out to plant the tree into, and that will help to reduce erosion in that situation. Um, and then we can do two things. So we, we plant our trees in our pastures, and then we have to manage that forage in that pasture two ways to manage that. We can manage as a hay for two to four years and let those trees get up a little bit before we actually turn livestock in, or we can actually protect tree rows with some temporary electric fencing for two to four years. Um, 
The, the other alternative we don't talk a lot about is, is planting at a little bit higher tree density and just expecting that we're going to lose some to livestock damage during grazing. So there's different arrangements. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but but if you just look at this diagram, we can we, we want to have about eight to 12 feet between trees and rows, and then we can vary the row spacing anywhere from 16 to 30 feet. This is a single row tree arrangement. Um, we can have double row where we have two rows relatively close together and um, and then a larger area between for forage production, 20 to 40 feet. Um, the nice thing about this is that when they thin, they can come in from each side and actually take trees out as that as that stand starts to mature. Um, so it gives easy access from each side. We have triple row arrangement um, where we have three rows together, then forage, and three rows together and forage. Um, the the nice thing about the triple row tree arrangement is that the middle row is shaded from both sides, so that reduces a problem associated with um, silvo pastures called epicormic branching. And, and epicormic branching is when the tree on the stem develops branches. And by shading in a, in a solid stand, we shade those tree trunks so we have less branching on the tree trunks. So we'll still have epicormic branching here um, on the two outside rows, but the inside row will have less epicormic branching. So it'll be a little bit higher tree quality. Another way we manage that epicormic branching is um, is we actually will go in and prune those branches off in a silva pasture situation. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then we can have an equidistance planning, which means a, a equal distance, just kind of in a grid, and then come in and thin over time. So we may come in in, in five years or whatever and, and actually take a row of these trees out to make more distance between these trees. The last thing I want to mention is, is going from a clear cut to a silvo pasture. And a clear cut is, is when a um, when a timber stand is is completely harvested. We have a lot of clear cuts in the in the Mid-Atlantic and, and southern region in Log Lolly pine plantation. So every tree is cut and then and then those stands would be replanted. And again, we, we want to remove debris and mulch stumps and, and add any fertility that we need in that situation. And, and generally speaking, the fertility requirement would be fairly high, similar to what we talked about earlier. Um, and then we need to decide on row spacing and orientation. We plant trees and then establish our forage. And then manage this forage for two to four years and then protect tree or protect trees with temporary fencing. And again, we have to decide on that tree arrangement. I'll just tell you a, a kind of an interesting story. So we did a demonstration. I'm not going to have time to talk about today, I think, but um, where we planted some different tree spacing, so different spaces between rows of trees. And, and I had in my mind the, the way trees are planted is that you hire a tree planting crew and they actually come in and um, mostly Hispanic and then they plant the trees usually on a eight by eight or an eight or a 10 by 10 grid. So every 10 feet that would plant a tree. And so you've got um, migrant workers moving across the landscape um, in, in planting trees very quickly. Uh, so I had in my mind set up, I had a detailed protocol set up where we were gonna plant trees at different um, row spacings. What became very apparent when the tree planting crew arrived is that that they could not speak English and I could not speak Spanish. And um, so my, my plans of planning different row spacings really went out the window fast. Um, so what I had them do was just plan a 10 by 10 grid. And then we actually went in and we disc out rows of trees to get the, the density that we wanted. I want to just talk a little bit about post planting tree management. Um, so, what one of the one of the things that we like to do with silbo pastures is really produce a high quality saw timber if we can. So we're we're decreasing the total amount of um, 
trees that we're producing, but the idea is to produce a little bit higher quality saw timber. And we would uh, initiate um, uh, pruning of branches at 15 to 20 feet tall. So what we're trying to do is remove those tree branches along the, the boles of the tree or the tree trunk um, and produce a very high quality straight saw timber. And we would do that um, until we get about 18 to 32 feet of branch free tree trunk. And this is best done in, in winter. So it's a little bit more labor intensive, but the idea is to improve the quality of that saw timber in that stand. And then thinning, we, we wanna keep that stand thinned out. So we'll be thinning every five to seven years. And, and the amount of thinning that we do will depend a little bit on the species we have. If we have a warm season grass underneath those tree stands, it warm season grasses don't uh, light saturate until about full sunlight in photosynthesis. So we're going to have to have a little bit thinner canopy uh, to support production of cool season grasses or warm season grasses. Cool season grasses light saturate at 50% full sunlight. So we can have a little bit um, heavier stand or more shading within that in that system. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop there and see if there's any questions. Uh, this is a really neat silvo pasture management guide that's available online. If, if you're really interested in silvo pastures, it's got a lot of details that we went over today uh, in this management guide, and it's available at, at the link below. So, Jimmy, I'm going to turn it back over to you and see if there's any questions. Very good, Chris. Um, well, I, I've... Uh... Please, you please unmute yourself or type the questions in the chat box. Uh, Chris, I've got one. What forages would be best if you're going to, you know, start from scratch and you're going to put together a system like this? Which ones would you kick, go with? Take that to Kelly because she actually did that work underneath it. She can tell you just a little bit about a shade study that she did. Kelly, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So tell, tell them about your shade study and what forages found that were the best underneath the shade study. Um, so briefly, I guess we had tried three different levels of shade. Um, we made artificial shade structures because we couldn't, um, we didn't have access to a fully established silvopasture at the time. Um, and so what we did is we had this varied shade levels as well as different forage treatments under all the shade. Um, our first was kind of a typical Virginia pasture, uh, tall fescue and white clover, um, which is kind of the standard recommendation, I guess. Um, we had what we called a simple mixture that had tall fescue, orchard grass, white clover and red clover. And then a complex mixture, which had uh, seven different things, all the things in the simple mixture, plus some alfalfa, Kentucky bluegrass, bluegrass and bird's foot trefoil. And kind of what we found was with adding shade, we really altered the botanical composition of these mixtures that we had. So at lower levels of shade, um, we called it our 30% shade treatment. The tall fescue did really well. Um, and so did the red clover. And then, but once we added either 50 or 70% shade, um, our mixtures were being more dominated by orchard grass. Um, and if you kind of think of the name orchard grass, they named it that because it was found underneath kind of orchard situations that had a tree canopy. So it was um, adapted to that environment already. And so it makes a really good um, grass in these silvopasture systems. And red clover did really well as well, um, even at those higher shade levels. Um, but the issue with red clover is that you have to um, reseed a little more frequently than you would white clover, for instance, because at least as far as I know, um, they, is it a biennial, Chris? Or I know Ozzy called it a short-lived perennial. Yeah, I, I usually call it a short-lived perennial. I don't know. Jimmy did some good work years and years ago when, when we were still babies <laughs> um, on, on red clover varieties. And what he found is you get a, another year, right, Jimmy, out of improved red clover varieties. That's right. So, but it's, it's still fairly short-lived. I would yeah. say compared to other forges. Yeah. So thanks, Kelly.
Chris, have you tested any forage land for soil fertility? The, the cost of bringing the land up to uh, good levels in Virginia was pretty staggering. Yeah, I haven't done that here. Um, I, I need to go out and just get some, some samples. I actually took a soil test. I don't, I was looking for it laying on my desk. I need to clean my desk. Um, from here, from a forested area that has never had any fertilizer on it. So I did either. In, in, in my dad's farm in Ohio, and, um, and I think the cost of increasing the soil fertility in that area would be pretty staggering too, <laughs> too because the, the pH, our natural pH here in a forested area is probably going to be right at, at five or below, a little bit below. So that's going to be a pretty high lime requirement. Plus, um, the, the phosphorus will probably be pretty low also. And potash will probably be, well, depending on the soil type and that, that low to medium range too. So, it, I mean, it's, you have to make that initial investment. So, Chris, for the, the average, you know, beef cattle uh, fescue farm, is, is there a, a, a early application or a first step that you, you want them to take if they were going to try to do this or just get shade in the pasture and let that suffice? Any, any thoughts? I, I, I think it's, it's, it's possible to do this here. And most of the systems here would probably be hardwood based. And the last project we did in Virginia actually had, it was kind of a neat area. It was a 40 acre demo and we had 20 acres of pine trees on one side and 20 acres of hardwoods on the other side. So they were just adjacent to each other in that, in that system. And we actually were able to establish a replicated silvo pasture of hardwoods and one of, of um, pines on the other side. Both worked, but one of the challenges, we, we had more blowovers in the hardwood area than we did in the pines when we thinned it. So, uh -huh. Um, and that could have something to do with the, the size of the crown of hardwood trees tends to be larger than, than pine trees. Yeah. So when we remove some of that, that, that codependency within the hardwood stands, we tend to have a few more blowovers. Interesting. But they weren't terrible. They weren't a terrible amount. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll pause and see if we've got questions from the group. I do have a question. Um, in the study that Kelly mentioned, was that also, was there any gr testing of like grazing tolerance of those same mixtures while under shade? We weren't able to incorporate livestock into that study. Um, it so happened that where we had our plots, we weren't allowed to have cows on that part of the farm. Um, as far as grazing tolerance and um, Gene Olson does a lot at UK, but I do know, you know, animals definitely show a preference. Um, and especially in some of the grazing trials that he's done is they will pick certain plots to go to first, but then if they're allowed unrestricted access, they'll keep wanting to go to those. Um, and orchard grass is often referred to as kind of the ice cream to cows. Um, they really, really like it. Um, so I guess as far as, um, like Chris said, management is one of the key things when it comes to silvopasture. And so making sure they're not continuously grazing these species that they want to eat that are really high quality um, could be an issue, I guess. Yeah, we did we did clip yields underneath the um, so we didn't have grazing but we did harvest yields and look at nutritive value of those um, shade plots too. Okay, thank you. All right, Chris, I don't see any questions in the chat box, so I want to thank you for for. Uh, speaking to the class and we appreciate that very much. My pleasure. All right. And um, if you all have any questions or there's a, there's a real nice playlist of um, Sopo pasture presentations on the uh, YouTube channel, the KY Forges YouTube channel from a um, 
training session we did for NRCS people. Um, so you're welcome to watch those if you need some late night uh, <laughs> things to watch. Absolutely. All right. All right, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. See you. Thank you. Thank See you.